so today you've jumped on a um, TechSoup Connect South Australia NT chapter. We're a, uh, a joint chapter in the centre column of Australia. Um, if you're not sure about what TechSoup Connect is all about, um, your local TechSoup Connect organisers in this part of the world are myself and Kat. Even though she speaks funny, she's actually from, uh, she's actually living in South Australia. And I'm now um, officially an Australian citizen. There you go. Yes, <laughs> as of March. So TechSoup Connect is a global network of tech for good meetups. So um, TechSoup is a nonprofit that helps other nonprofits get, implement and use technology effectively. Um, and TechSoup Connect's all about helping to bring the uh, the corporate sector and the nonprofit sector together for, for social good. Um, TechSoup Connect Global Network is very global. So there's 128 cities in 41 countries everywhere where you can see those red dots. That's not measles. That's a TechSoup Connect uh, local group. Um, particularly in the US, but in Australia, we've got a few different groups. Um, if you haven't heard of TechSoup Connect before, you may be familiar with the old name, which was, uh, was NetSquared. Um, TechSoup have recently rebranded those into, Nets, into TechSoup Connect. Um, so the community values for TechSoup Connect, um, we welcome everyone. Um, we put community first. We're here to support each other. Um, we're here to build stronger nonprofits, and technology is one of the tools that we use to do that. Um, we do invite participation. So Rabina will be taking questions today. Uh, make ample use of the chat function, um, which should be in the top right-hand corner of your screen um, to ask any questions that you have. Um, and we treat each other with kindness and, and with respect. Um, we always need your help. So if you have any um, ideas for an event, any expertise that you can share, um, TechSoup Connect is always after event producers, marketing, um, welcoming people and, uh, and any other cool ideas that we've got for how we can share our knowledge amongst the community. Uh, in Australia, the local TechSoup partner is connecting up. Um, if you're in a non-profit and you haven't heard of Connecting Up before, you should. Um, jump on the Connecting Up website, connectingup.org. Um, Connecting Up are a non-profit that's best known for a technology donations and discounts program for other non-profits. So they are the non-profit that can help you access, say, the Microsoft donations program or the Google donations program in Australia. Um, and there's some of their other partners as well. All right. Um, if you need any technology help, particularly for a nonprofit, then um, don't hesitate to jump over to forums.techsoup.org where you can get some answers to some technology questions that have been challenging you or let us know on the um, TechSoup Connect SA Facebook page or the TechSoup Connect NT Facebook page. Um, and we'd be happy to, to see how we can help as well. Um, and the sponsors for TechSoup Connect Adelaide are Refuel Creative, which is where I'm from and our speaker today is from, and also Create Your Change, which is where Kat is from. All right, brilliant. Let's talk about today's guest. I can top, <laughs> stop sharing my screen and we can, we can get cracking on today's session. So. Today's guest is uh, Rabina Carlson, who is the Digital Marketing Manager at Refuel Creative. Um, that's how we were able to get her to speak at such a fair and reasonable price. <laughs> um, Rabina has been a, a social media zealot for about 700 years, um, despite the fact that she's nowhere near 700. Very well done, <laughs> Rabina. Um, she's got a genuine passion for all things marketing and technology. Um, and not only has she spent um, the last 10 or so years using that digital marketing expertise for the, the tourism and the for-profit sector, um, she's also been a board member and been involved in a number of nonprofits as well. Um, she has developed and delivered courses dedicated to social media at TAFE and the University of South Australia, 
um, and she's one of our organisers for Social Media Day Digital Adelaide, which is coming up in July. Is there anything else I need to plug and or mention, Rebecca? Uh, look, I think I think you've done a, a pretty good job there. Uh, yeah. I think uh, let's get into the the reason we're here. I think that's what we're up to. That's what we're up to. So again, yeah. make sure you make ample use of the chat function if you've got any questions, um, and Rubina will answer them as as she gets the opportunity. But I'll hand over to you, Rubina. Awesome. All right. Uh, present screen. Okay, this is going to be. Let's have a look. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, Chrome tab. Uh, sorry guys, just making sure I'm pulling out the right section, otherwise I'll be in a bit of trouble. Okie dokie. So hopefully this is, yes, oh, amazing. Okay, cool. Was just checking to see how this was all working. Alrighty. So the first thing before we kind of get into things, I'd really love to hear from all of you. Um, there are, looks like there's eight of you attending uh, who aren't Ryan, Kat and myself. Um, I'd love to hear from you in the chat where you're from and uh, whether you're in the, the not-for-profit or the, the social enterprise space um, or, you know, what's what's brought you here today. So if you guys could just take a few minutes to let us know where you've come from, uh, I'd love to see it in the chat because uh, then that way hopefully I'll be able to tailor some examples that might be more specific to your organisation or at least um, to the, the sector that you're operating in. Alrighty, well, let's uh, get this show on the road. So first but foremost, social media strategy is a, a huge um, undertaking and can be a little bit, um, I guess, overwhelming for some. So today what we're going to do is we're going to break it down into some different segments um, so that it's a bit more manageable and a bit more um, accessible, I guess, to everyone. So let's get started. So we'll cover off on a few different areas today, um, those being goals, stakeholders. We'll talk about brand personality, uh, messaging and content. We'll look at the channels as well, social media channels. Um, we'll have a chat about content calendars, about scheduling tools, campaigns, and if by then you still have some energy left, uh, we'll get on to KPIs and metrics. So... Let's kick off. Where do we start? Social media strategy really should be part of the overall business goals or the, the, the organization's goals. And anything that you're going to be doing in that space ultimately should be serving those organizational goals. So for the first way to get started is really to go back to the organization's goals, go back to the vision statement, go back to um, the mission statement uh, and have a look at what is it the organization is trying to achieve. And then from there, think about, okay, well, if um, our goals are to increase, you know, the number of people donating, um, to re-engage with existing volunteers, um, to, you know, tell them about your projects, or perhaps it might be, you know, trying to look at a way to engage staff or even engage customers of your service if you're, um, for example, providing services to, you know, domestic violence victims or um, to the homeless, you know, looking at, at that side of things as well. It's about looking at, okay, well, what then could you look at doing on social media that's going to help achieve those goals? And what objectives can you set for your social media uh, strategy that is actually going to align with um, the organization's goals. So sometimes it's hard to think about these things in the abstract. And so I actually have picked a, an organization to share some examples with you today. Um, I am a proud member of the Multiple Births Australian uh, organization here in uh, South Australia. I had twins a couple of years ago now. Um, and so they have been a really, really strong support uh, during that time of adjusting to motherhood, not just with our eldest, but also with twins. So I thought that um, paying homage to them uh, would be appropriate in today's um, uh, today's presentation. And so this is an example of how you can look at setting some social media smart objectives, um, you know, and it's really important that you kind of keep those specific, measurable, attainable um, 
uh, time focused and uh, I always forget the letter R every time I do a smart goal. Um, but in irrelevant, of course, being the final one, it's about trying to come up with those objectives so that they do help to serve that overall goal. So the goal um, of multiple births um, here in South Australia, one of the main things that they do is to provide multiple birth families with a practical support um, and also a network of connections across South Australia to empower them to thrive. So the sense of community is really important and really strong. So if we were to then take that kind of bigger business goal um, or rather the organisation's goal, and put it into, okay, well, what could we do with a social media objective and how could we put it together so it's smart? Something we could consider is, okay, well, we want to see an increase in interactions by 25% in the Facebook group by 30th of June. Um, multiple births have a Facebook group that consists of members uh, and they there is a lot of lovely support. If you are a mum, you've probably joined a few Facebook groups over your time. Um, in this particular one, you know, obviously there's a focus towards, you know, people who have got, um, you know, when particularly in the early stages of life, um, you know, how do you cope with feeding two babies at the same time and some of those practical things, but also just providing support for one another when things do get a little bit crazy or hectic or tough. But ultimately what we're trying to do here by developing this SMART objective is to think about what it is that actually would represent this goal being achieved. Um, and, you know, a sort of a, a metric, I guess, for showing how that could be achieved. So these are things that we keep in mind as we're developing our strategy and everything that we do should be in line with that goal and then ultimately any smart objectives that fall out from that. Then we move on to stakeholders. So now we need to think about, okay, well, who are our stakeholders? You might be thinking about the ones that you have internally, uh, whether they're volunteers or employees. Um, they could be external, so you could be looking at donors, you could be looking at people who take up your services um, and certainly, you know, thinking about who they are and what their needs are. Um, you know, for someone who is a donor to, um, you know, Multiple Births South Australia, it might just be that, you know, they had, might have had a really rough period initially. Um, perhaps they had preemie babies, and in fact, most twins are. Um, you know, and perhaps the support they received at the time really impacted on them, and so they want to find that way to give back when they're able to later on in life. So that might be one of the needs um, you know, or one of the drivers uh, or motivators for that particular person to then, you know, take action and make a donation or, you know, look at other ways to support the community by getting involved and volunteering on committees or play groups or however um, that sort of passion and motivation does come through. Uh, so there are the things that we need to think about. What are their needs? It might be also when you're looking at volunteers, it's about trying to figure out, well, why do they want to volunteer with our organisation or, or what, what, is it, what, is that, what are their needs? Because ultimately the answers to these questions are going to help you to craft content that appeals to these people and hopefully in the long term take the action that you want them to take, whether it is just sharing a post so that you can increase your awareness um, of your organisation and your organisation's activities, or ultimately if you want them to actually become, you know, financial supporters of your organisation. Other things to consider when you're trying to think about who your stakeholders are, you know, what appeals to them? So, you know, are they more likely to respond to a video, um, you know, a testimonial of, a, of someone who your organisation has helped? Um, are they more likely to respond to nice infographics rather than a really long-winded um, annual report? Um, are they, you know, do they expect to have a quick response? So if you are running a donations campaign and, you know, we ha you haven't got automated emails to confirm that the um, donation's been received, do you think that that would be something that the person, uh, that your potential donor would expect? Um, if they're asking you questions on social or engaging with you across social media, are they expecting a quick response? 
um, because all of these different factors will help you to craft then a strategy and then implement the strategy where you're, um, that will actually then result in the, the objectives being met. The other thing to, to think about is on the flip side, while we're talking about all these lovely positive things, is to look at what frustrates them or what are what are their pain points? What is it that, you know, really gets under their skin um, that they can't stand? You know, what, what kind of things can you do to alleviate those um, pain points? And then finally, where are they? You know, uh, not everyone is on TikTok funnily enough. Um, and, you know, certainly majority of the Australian population are on Facebook. That's certainly true. But looking at um, who this person is in terms of how old they are typically or what stage in life they're at, um, you know, will give you a very, fairly strong indication as to what social media platforms they're likely to be lurking on. What I find to be a useful tip to have a look at this is while there are um, social media reports that are released annually, uh, probably the most current one at the moment would be one that's released by We Are Social and Hootsuite. It's a combined global social media usage report. Um, it's also useful just to look at the ads uh, manager for any of the platforms and just see what you what happens when you put in the keywords and see approximately how big those audiences are. Um, yeah, Facebook in particular, you can look at, you know, certainly the demographics, the, the gender, any specific interests, you know, that your potential, that your stakeholders have. And then it can kind of give you an idea of the size of the audience. Um, similarly with LinkedIn, that'll give you a fairly similar thing. It's fairly broad brush, but at least it will give you an idea of how likely it is that your um, stakeholders are there. And particularly when you're then going to be looking at running paid social media activity, you really don't want to be spending it in a platform where your audience isn't. Having said that, if you are trying to convince, uh, you know, tweens and people in their early 20s um, to come and volunteer with you, TikTok's probably not something you should dismiss. Perhaps it might be something that you consider not from an advertising perspective, but it could be something that you consider um, from a organic perspective and putting together some video content and so on. So I do think that there is always a, a place for that. Um, you know, it's, it's about really understanding who your stakeholders are and, and where they're likely to be and, and what frame of mind they're going to be in as well. Um, you know, certainly when any of you would be visiting LinkedIn, I'm sure you don't go in there with a, a fun mindset half the time or most of the time. You're there in a business context. So it's almost like you've got your professional slash learning slash networking hat on when you are in that platform. Whether you're there to kind of look at uh, opportunities to, to volunteer, that might be something you're looking for. I know certainly you can set your personal LinkedIn profiles to that. Um, you know, I'm currently looking for volunteering opportunities on boards or volunteering opportunities here and there. So potentially from a volunteer recruitment drive, it could be a really useful um, tool to consider. But in terms of, you know, when you're trying to just, you know, get some broader awareness for your organisation, perhaps um, something like Facebook, which is essentially the juggernaut of all social, might be the place for it. So ultimately what this all comes back to is really understanding who your stakeholders are. Now let's talk about personality. Um, personality is critical for success, is critical to success for brands as well as people. Don't leave it to chance. Uh, famous words there from Sir Richard Branson. So given that social media is this two-way street of conversation that's going um you know, between people uh, going backwards and forwards. Uh, it's not just like a billboard or a radio ad or, or, or a, um, a, a community announcement on uh, TV. It's not something that you kind of set and forget. It's not something that you can just push out into the ether and just hope for something to happen. Ultimately, it's a two-way conversation and people like engaging with people. So considering how your brand is going to be to sound or how it's written is really important um, when it comes to developing a strategy and all these things that you need to consider. Tone of voice is really important. But while we're kind of talking about it at this sort of, I guess, more of a, a a brand theory kind of level, sometimes it's just as easy to think about it uh, with a simple question like this as a prompter. 
how would you describe your organisation if they were a person? So if they were a person, would they be casual? Would they be formal? Would they be professional? Um, would they be down to earth? Would they be heartfelt, kind, passionate? Um, hopefully, uh, you know, we wouldn't use any sort of negative ones like, um, you know, dismissive or rude or anything like that. But equally, that's important to think about the things, not only just what, you, what your organisation, if they were a person, what would they be like? It's also what they would not be like as well. Um, and again, this all kind of comes into fit, fit, feeding into your social media guidelines that would advise people who are speaking on behalf of your organisation how they how they are expected to act um, and and what their what the expectations are there. So these are kind of just a few prompters here, and um, hopefully they kind of trigger some big deeper thoughts um, for your organisation as you go along. But ultimately, it's really important to have those um, guidelines in place so that everybody who's answering on behalf of the organisation, if you're fortunate enough to have, you know, perhaps it might be the CEO is doing it plus someone who does marketing and maybe a volunteer. If that's the case, then at least everyone knows how they're expected to respond and, and what is the, um, the appropriate tone of voice and language and so on. Which kind of then brings us back into messaging. So we're talking now about how about messaging. So what's really important here is to think about your go back to the mission statement and the vision statement. We're always going to be looking back to the goals and to the objectives. Um, but ultimately, you need to develop three to five key messages. So these are the sort of the core messages um, of your offering. So for multiple births, South Australia, for example, it would be that. They want to provide that sense of community um, for families with multiples in their family, so twins, triplets, quads, et cetera. Uh, but they also do want to provide that practical support. They do have a, um, there is a program for um, the first 12 months of, of life for multiples uh, where you have access to 18 hours of support. So a nurse will come to your house and spend time with you doing whatever needs to be done, whether that's settling a child, feeding a child or, you know, feeding your other children as the case may be. It just depends on what support that mother needs or that family needs. Um, but ultimately it's about trying to nail down what those key messages are and how they flow back into, I guess, the values of the organisation as well as the, the mission statement. So, you know, for um, multiple births, it might be, you know, we provide support for new um, multiple parents. I think that's typically, or multi-parents, that's typically the terminology that they use as a bit of a shortcut. Um, the second message might be join our supportive community online and um, there are in-person meetups as well on a semi-regular basis. And then they also would have something around probably the, the Play and Connect that they do, which is uh, essentially like an unofficial play group. Um, I've been to a few and it's uh, it's a quite interesting when you see all these twins running around the yard. It's, it's quite hilarious, actually. Um, and it's also quite chaotic as well. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's about promoting, you know, to come be part of the community, but then also perhaps highlighting some of those specific services or products. The other thing you need to keep in mind when you're developing your key messages is the customer, well, what we would call the customer journey, or even in this case, it might be the stakeholders journey, whether it's how they become a volunteer, what you know, or how they become a donor um, or how they become a part of what you're doing. So thinking about what you would be saying to someone who doesn't know about your organisation is also important because we have to recognise that messaging, while there are these core messages, some of these messages are more appropriate to tell someone who doesn't know anything about your organisation uh, compared to someone who is actually an involved part um, of your organisation, either as a volunteer or as a, a service recipient. But then ultimately it's like, okay, well, if they're already engaged or they already like our content on socials, how do we then encourage them to take that next step? So what more information do we need to give them? Um, it might be that, you know, for people who 
don't know anything about your organization that you keep it quite broad and you really keep on focusing on the read the purpose of your organization in your communications and then following on from that people who have been engaged for a while you probably want to start talking more about the practical impacts that their support has had and then what you would be able to do if there's more support coming online so those I think are the things to keep in mind with your messages um, you know there are different messages for different times and for different stakeholders as well. Content, that's what we're up to you next. So this is kind of just some broad strokes for content, but essentially what we're looking at here is, you know, with your categories, you want to come up with some categories and, you know, five is definitely sufficient. Um, but essentially you want to think about what kinds of content you're going to share. For some people, creating, um, you know, a social media calendar can be quite daunting. Um, I personally have found over the years that, you know, sometimes people refer to them as content pillars, um, but creating content categories just makes it so much more accessible and so much easier to then plot out what you're going to be writing about. So for multiple births, say, for example, um, their categories could be something along the lines of, okay, we'd like to feature um you know a family and you know what the what the support mbsa has provided has meant to that family so testimonial type content promotion of events uh there is um unfortunately the christmas event last year was cancelled due to covid restrictions um but essentially every year they have a really big christmas party where there's you know five or six hundred people meeting in a park um and it's just this on mass picnic with twins and triplets well mostly twins running around with their siblings um but ultimately event promotion would be another category for the types of content that they would be sharing um Another one would be just information about the services that they run. Uh, and also the they also run a series of webinars as well for new parents or expecting parents as well. So those are some of the examples of the categories that you could use. So depending on your organization, and again, look back to those objectives once more as to what kind of, um, you know, information or what kind of content is going to appeal to those people and then kind of, separate them into categories. The other good thing about using categories is that when you then are planning out your social media content calendar, you can then have a look and say, oh, actually we've done five things that are testimonial related this week and we've done nothing else. Well, that seems a bit repetitive and then you can identify some trends there and so on. So it just helps you with your planning as well and giving an even spread of um, the content, the types of content you want to be sharing. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, the mediums you're going to be using. So image and copy is a fairly straightforward thing. Uh, Canva is probably the biggest godsend available. And uh, Ryan, you might have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought there was something that Canva does for not-for-profits, but we can come back to that. Um, but essentially, you know, plan out what kind of images you might need, um, whether you might need to arrange to have photographers at events or at fundraisers. Um, you know, whether you're going to be writing loads and loads of copy and blogs and sharing that kind of those insights that avail from there. Uh, if you're intending on doing video or audio, again, more planning required, making sure you've got some equipment to do um, to take the videos. You know, certainly um, I think for some not-for-profits, it actually works in your favour if the content is a bit raw, uh, mainly because I think there's an association with um, not for profits in people's minds that, you know, perhaps they shouldn't be spending money on marketing. So I'd say I'd almost argue that, you know, in this case, the, the rawer your content can be in a way, uh, the, the better it will be. And then the final consideration for content is curation. So it's about looking at what kind of um, other sources of content are available to you. Are you able to use content that is generated by your members? Are you able to use content um, that's generated by people who use your services? Uh, are there other bodies that do similar work to you that are you would consider authorities on the topic and so you'd like to share posts to their um, papers, blogs, etc. cetera? Um, again, that's uh, kind of that, all right? Okay, I uh, notice that uh, I've just had a look at the chat and I can see there's quite an extensive um, uh, listing, uh, people have listed through some of their experience. So yeah, no, this is, uh, this is great.
Uh, Gillian, that sounds like some really interesting work in that area um, in terms of raising uh, awareness and activism in the field of against men's violence, against women. Um, and then Harvest Digital Planning, again, NFPs, which is great. Uh, UGC is user-generated content cat. Um, thanks, Ryan, for jumping in there. Yes, Canva for not for profits, cool. All right. Sorry, I thought I'd better actually come back to the chat for a minute because I've been kind of focusing on the slides. So let's roll back on here with the with the content. And then uh, here's a lovely photo of fish in case you were kind of getting, uh, you know, needed to reactivate your interest here. Um, it's an old adage, fish, fish where the fish are. But as I said before at the beginning of my presentation, you know, it's really important that we... Um, target the channels that are actually going to be where your stakeholders are lurking. Um, there used to be this rule, and I don't know if it's as applicable today, but there used to be this rule, 99-1. 90% of people are just there lurking, looking at things uh, on social media. 9% are actually engaging with content, uh, and 1% are creating it. Um, that's a that's a really old uh, stat, and I don't know how true it stands up to today. Because I think for some pages, you know, there certainly is tons and tons of engagement, um, depending on the you know the the presence and the type of content and so on. But it's really important to to pick your battles with social. There are, as we were saying before, there are so many. There's you know you have the big ones like Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, time and a place. Um, you know, certainly Pinterest, then you've got TikTok, Snapchat, and then there's all these uh, WhatsApp even and what kind of, you know, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer, um, social networks, whether they're relevant to you or not as well. Um, but ultimately you need to think about those places where your stake stakeholders are likely to be lurking. And once you've kind of figured that out, you can then take different approaches to different channels. So you might start with like an informative approach where you decide, okay, well, we're not going to be active on Twitter. It's just not where our audience is, but we are going to claim our handle so that no one else can pretend to be us. And we are going to put the information in the bio and then have a tweet, just a single tweet um, posted there that advises people where they can find us. Hey, we're not active on it, Twitter right now, but if you want to check out the latest, join us on an insert link to Facebook, Instagram, or wherever you might be. And again, you know, that can apply to, you can take that approach to any different um, channel. Then you might step it up and say, okay, well, actually our um, our audience is on is on Facebook, so we'll, we'll be a bit more active there. You could adopt um, an interactive approach where you sort of like, okay, well, we'll share other people's content. We won't really do much of our own content. We'll just do some basics. Um, but mostly we're there to act in more of a curator capacity and then be very responsive when people give us, um, when people are uh, inquiring or commenting or liking or sharing or whichever. And then finally, you can then have, I guess, uh, probably like, you know, at the most in time attempts intense approach, in time intensive approach, I should say, uh, which is like creative. So essentially that's where you go, okay, yep, we're going to create content. We're going to post, you know, five times a week. We're going to do this. We're going to do that and so on and so on. Um, as you know, I would always say that, you know, it's really important to make sure you got those basics right. Um, you know, make sure that you fill out the about sections, the profile sections, the bio, make sure that the link that you've got on Instagram, make sure that's the one that counts, whether you're driving donations or um, to your home page. If you have multiple things you want to link to on, link, uh, on, on Instagram, you can certainly use a service like Linktree to then put multiple links there um, within the platform. So it is really important to think about, as I said, those stakeholders where they're likely to be lurking and where they're likely to engage with you. So then you can kind of gauge what level of investment you need to put into each of those channels. Okay. Alrighty. Metrics. Uh, so this is kind of coming towards the end of the presentation. So I think I've, I've timed it pretty well. So certainly if you've got any questions, feel free to start asking them um, in the chat and then we'll have a discussion from there. Uh, but ultimately, um, metrics are just as important as the rest of what we've been discussing today. So it's really important to review goals. So go back to those objectives at the beginning 
and then find the metrics. So check out all the different metrics. There's tons of them. So you can go through your insights tab on for your Facebook page. Um, you can have a look at the uh, insights on link for your LinkedIn company page. Uh, if you've decided to invest in video and going hard on YouTube, have a look at all those um, analytics that sit behind YouTube. Um, you know, pretty much every platform these days is going to have some kind of level of um, metrics that you'll be able to measure. With Instagram, um, you certainly will be able to get uh, some basic things out of, from the business account. Um, but, you know, if you end up looking at a third, some third party software, you can probably get some more insights out of Instagram as well. Um, but ultimately, what you're looking for there is you're looking for social media metrics that align. So if you're saying we need to increase awareness of our brand or increase awareness of our organisation within the Adelaide area, then the kinds of social media metrics that are going to align are things like impressions, reach, frequency of engagement um, to kind of establish are people actually starting to take notice and um, be aware of your brand. And then finally, once you've kind of decided on what those metrics are that you're going to use um, to measure against your SMART objectives is to um, then go and measure them regularly. So don't forget about that. Um, social media, like all digital um, platforms, is ever-evolving, ever-changing, and always, um, you know, it's something new is going to be happening, whether there's a new section on your page you can fill out or a new type of tab they've released for your page type on Facebook or, um, you know, there's always going to be something changing. So it's really important to keep looking at those metrics to see um, if those changes are having any impact and also just how you're going with your content. Is the content categories, are the content categories you've decided on, are they actually working to increase engagement if that is the overall goal? If they are, great, and kind of can continue and keep cranking out the content. If they're not, then that's the moment to say, you know, well, I actually need to go back and have a look at what is what is resonating and what is not, and then perhaps we need to shift the way we talk about topics that don't appeal to our audience that are still necessary. Um, so that's kind of the things that you, you need to keep in mind. From uh, developing your metrics is also not to forget about them. Uh, make sure you go back and check them. Uh, monthly, I think, is sufficient for, for most people. But, you know, in those early days, you might be sort of looking at it a bit more frequently. Um, and weekly would be fine as well. So just to kind of round out an example here for multiple births, um, you know, if the objective is, as we set at the beginning of this presentation, to increase interactions by 25% in face in the Facebook group by 30 June, what kind of metrics can we use to actually see to see that? One of them is looking at um, with Facebook groups when you're an admin, you're able to see the number of active members in the group. So if you're seeing that, you know, there's say 100 people who are in the group but only 50 of them are active, you might then set a benchmark to say, well, by 30 June we want to see that 75 people are, uh, sorry, increase by 25%. So sorry, so that would be like another 12 people being engaged. Um, so, okay, well, we want to see over 60 people engage with um, the page, so we want them to be active. The other uh, metric that would be relevant in this case is the number of posts in the group. So, you know, it might be that you see, you know, that every day you're seeing there's one or two posts a day. You might say, okay, well, we want to see, you know, three posts a day or something like that. So you look at ways to encourage that and that's really where from a, um, an admin such moderator perspective, trying to prompt conversations is, is really important when you're looking at this sort of metric here. But I'm sure as uh, we've kind of got to this point of it, um, you know, there's a lot of different areas that we've just touched on today. Uh, you know, we've talked about stakeholders. Um, we've talked about how people, um, you know, might want to interact with your brand. We've talked about the content. We've talked about the messaging. We've talked about the channels and we've talked about this and that. So the question is, how do you manage all of it? And that's really where the these four things are really good. These four tools are really going to help you to do that. First thing, uh, content calendars. So have a look at 
Um, you know, spreadsheets are the age-old uh, good choice. Uh, you know, they're accessible to everybody, uh, whether you have taken advantage of the Microsoft donation program or you just use Google Docs for free uh, um, or Google Sheets for free, I should say. Um, you know, that is a, a fairly standard way of starting out. As you kind of move through, you may find that, okay, well, actually putting together the calendar in the spreadsheet every month is really quite um, time consuming. You then might decide at that point that you're ready to move to a different uh, platform. Trello, I have found to be quite useful for this, for social media content planning. Um, you can have different, you know, cards um, set up for each piece of content. You can then put them into, uh, I think it's called a deck, but essentially you put it under, you can have your content categories running across the top. Because essentially it's a task management system, you could then have the date that you intend to publish it, color code each of them, and then you use the calendar power up and then it will actually display all of that data in a really beautiful um, calendar format. So then you'll be able to see it as what needs to be done each um, each week or each day or however many posts you're doing per month. Uh, Loomly and ClickUp are also other good options when it comes to planning, so content calendars. So that's kind of where, you, where you'll do your planning. Um, you know, like most people, you know, there isn't, uh, you don't always have the time to be putting your social media content out straight away. Um, uh, like, you know, you might not be available to do it. Uh, live all the time. So a scheduling tool is really going to help you. So if you've decided, okay, the frequency is going to be we're going to post twice a week on Facebook, um, once a week on Instagram, and that's that's it. You could use um, Creator Studio. Uh, that's the um, native uh, scheduling tool within Facebook. Um, you could also look at options like Buffer, Later, and Sprout Social. Um, Buffer do have a really reasonable free tier. So, if, again, if you're just starting out, it's worthwhile having a look at that to see if the, the free tier is sufficient for your needs. If you need something that's a little bit more, has a bit more um, control in terms of approval processes, um, you know, certainly something like Sprout Social is going to be more appropriate um, for that. I've certainly found that that function, the approval function is quite seamless in Sprout Social. Um, we're currently using it with one of our NFP clients and, yeah, it's just been really easy for them to just jump in and uh, give us the feedback right there on the, um, on the social media uh, posts that we've developed for them and then from there uh, able to make the changes and then approval and all that kind of thing. So if you are looking at perhaps bringing someone on who's in a, a volunteer role or in a junior role uh, and there needs to be some sort of oversight or approval over every post that they send out, um, you know, certainly looking at tools like that is going to be really helpful. Um, just getting back to messaging and uh, tone of voice, brand personality um, and the behaviour of anyone um, who is representing your organisation online, um, social media guidelines. So again, crafting those is really important. It's kind of like a, a Bible that will tell people how they should be responding. In your social media guidelines, I strongly recommend that you um, cover off on how you would respond uh, to negative feedback to constructive criticism, um, if somebody, uh, if there's, you know, hate speech or anything like that, what is your policy? Do you just block people? Um, you know, all of those things do need to be outlined in that guideline so that people know um, within the organisation what is the expectation there and, and how they're expected to behave. And then the final tip I have for you to manage all of this is just is to play and practice. Um, the planning phase, while it's really important and it's critical that you actually think about all of these elements, it also can be a little bit paralyzing too. Um, so I do think it's really important just to focus on, um, you know, okay, well, let's get, you know, some five messages down today and this is how we're going to respond to people when we speak to the organisation and then here are our content categories, all right, now we're just going to start trying to create it. Um, you know, I think it's really important that you 
kind of start to to play a little bit with social um, as both as your as your personal um, you know profile, what seeing what the platform can do and and how things uh, work, but also as your organisational representative, it's really important to have all the strategy, but also um, you know don't stop because you might be shifting the strategy don't stop because um you know there might be some brand changes in the in the near future um you know it's really important to kind of continue the momentum because without kind of really interacting engaging posting sharing and so on it's hard for you to then get feedback from your community as to what's working and what's not so we have come to the uh, end of the official presentation um, and I do invite you to uh, ask any questions uh, in the chat. Looks like we've got a couple here, one here from Jessica. All right. This is a really, really good in-depth one. I'm just going to read it out here. So uh, my biggest question is around planning for content and not overthinking it. Setting three to five categories makes sense. Just feel overwhelmed by the amount of content I should be creating and measuring. I've tried Trello, Google Calendar, and heard of Planner. Um, try it throughout social. Planner, plan, test, yep. Um, content. So I think um, that's uh, it's tricky when you're relying on other people for for content. And it's not just uh, you, you, and you just doing everything. Um, so I think that, you know, it's one way to do it is to kind of try and, particularly in the case of recruitment, um, Jessica, it's about trying to get them to understand what it means in real work terms. It's not like, oh, hey, I'm from marketing and uh, I need content from you now so that we can put it on socials what that person really needs to understand is if they give you this piece of content, what are you are you showing them the value of what it means for the organisation and potentially what it means for them as um, the consultant? You know, it might be that you say to them, look, we'd really like to um, feature you and some of your work with X um, because we think that it might help to... Um, you know, help us to, first of all, like, you know, recognise uh, client X, but also to then potentially, um, you know, appeal to other people who work in similar industries and potentially consider um, that recruitment consultant for assistance when they need help in that area. Um, but, yeah, I think that that's ultimately what it comes down to. It might even be that you kind of put together a few basic slides in Canva uh, that kind of just show some some key metrics that count to them. But in my experience, that's been the really big thing about trying to get people who aren't marketers, who aren't social media zealots, on board with this. It's really about just trying to ask, trying to get them to try to understand what's important to them, and then weaving social into that conversation as to how it can help them out. Um, so I think that that's that's kind of the the main main thing there. Um, Jessica, do let me know if I've answered your question or if you want me to chat some more about that. Certainly happy to. Um, so yeah, so that's that's a, a good way of doing it. But also, you know, potentially if you do have um, team meetings, that might be something that you might ask. Maybe it might be something that you ask to put in a team meeting. That's you know. Okay, I'd like one highlight of, of the week um, from someone here in the office so we can share it on socials or something like that. So, again, trying to, I guess, find ways to to bring it into the general conversation, I think, does certainly help with that. Hi, Andrew. It's been a while. Hope, uh, hope you're well. Um, uh, metrics for your organisation better to track and measure for your own growth than, say, watching and competing with similar organisations. Well, look, I think um, benchmarking against competitors is a useful um, thing to do when you're starting out. Um, and also it does help you to identify trends. So if you see that your pages are down on engagement and then your competitors' pages are down on engagement, you might then go, oh, well, actually, maybe there's some external factors here um, that have, you know, 
It might be that Facebook disabled your page as part of the news thing. Who knows? Um, but certainly that I think is helpful if you're trying to garner some wider context around what stats you're seeing. Um, if you are looking at, um, you know, trying to measure your own growth, I think it is important to look at your own your own data at that point and to look at it back sort of, you know, year on year or uh, month on month. Um, it is it is certainly helpful to kind of see the growth there. But again, it does come back to, you know, what metrics you are measuring and how they dovetail back into those smart objectives and then the overall um, sort of goal uh, of the um, and of the organization and purpose for being. Um, yeah, cool. So Jessica, a follow-up. Uh, so any top tips for Hang on a minute. I think I might. Did I miss something from you, Android? Is that the same question? That same question twice. That's okay. Um, so uh, top tips for planning content to make it easy as well. Well, there are um, certainly some things you can do, um, but they are kind of also traps in a way. Uh, if you ever get stuck on ideas for content, uh, looking at the days of the year is always a good start. The only problem with looking at days of the year, though, is that you can get kind of stuck down a rabbit hole of days of the year. Uh, and then you find all these random ones that are really exciting and really cool and things you want to be a part of. But ultimately, do they relate back to the organisation? And that is the big question that you have to ask um, from there. It's really about what is, um, you know, the, what is the purpose of, of me sharing this? Um, you know, for example, with um, multiple births, uh, there is a an awareness week that's run at the federal sort of level, at the national level. So there is a national organisation that um, multiple births is, is a part of. Um, and with the national organisation, you know, they, they run this big multiple birth awareness week and encourage all the members, you know, to update, you know, your profile with like a temporary little um, ribbon and, and things like that. So, you know, again, it... Um, kind of is things that you can look at and go, oh, well, we have to back on to that, you know, in terms of, you know, how can we tack on to that and, you know, leverage the sort of greater awareness that's happening around that particular day. Um, so I think that that certainly does um, help to make uh, tips for, uh, helps planning content easier, particularly if you get stuck on brainstorming ideas. Um, for uh, content categories will also help you significantly because if you kind of have, okay, we're going to feature, say, our team and then it might be uh, a client testimonial and then the other thing might just be office life um, or even depending on, you know, what it's like with the um, – the applicants and that's something I've noticed in recent times that real estate agents are doing they're actually using people in their databases so prospective buyers um, and featuring them on their Facebook pages and things like that so that might be another thing to consider from a recruitment standpoint um, but yeah definitely uh, try and test just do it Jess yes absolutely uh, Kat, do you have any uh, some suggestions for people who are going to alone it to are going it alone to brainstorm ideas for content? As I was saying before, um, days of the year can be a really useful starting point. Um, also, looking at you know your products or the services that you offer, and also look at the user content. So if there's um, you know, you're seeing that your organisation is getting tagged in um, certain posts. You can then have a look at those tagged posts and see what other people are posting about relating to your service. Um, and that might give you some more ideas as to what you can um, what you can put out there for content. Um, so I think that those are those are really helpful ones to to consider as well. Um, other things that you can do to brainstorm content, again, just go back to those categories, um, kind of drill, drill it down. Even looking at platforms that are quite visual like Instagram or Pinterest, kind of looking up your whatever your content categories are, seeing what other kinds of content are out there certainly help to, um, from an inspiration perspective. Okay, I'm just going to flip back to the general column and see. Um, thanks, Cindy, for coming. Awesome. All right. So are there any more questions? Uh, we've still got a few minutes left. I'm happy to take them. 
or we can give everybody an early minute if no one's got any more questions. Oh, we certainly can do that too. I've got opportunity to get any last questions out, everyone. And yeah, I mean, the, Jessica, that's a really good point. Just try things, test them, and as long as you've got a good uh, good reasoning and a, and a good foundation for, for trying those things, it's always worth giving them a go and seeing how your audience reacts to what you're testing. Mm -hmm. Now, Rabina, do you want to do the plug for a certain event that's coming up in July or should I? I know, I'm, I'm happy to do social media people that would be interested. Uh, yeah, actually, well, let's uh, let's wrap up with that. Um, so in case you uh, haven't seen it yet, the full wall, um, speaker lineup has been released for Social Media Day Digital Adelaide 2021. We're thrilled to be back at the Allen Scott Auditorium at UniSA at City West Campus. And very, very fortunately, we are able to do face to face this year. Um, you know, we are going to definitely have to lodge a COVID safe plan and do all the right things there. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to be coming back um, to a face to face event this year. Tickets are available at the link as Ryan has uh, just popped in the chat. Um, it's uh, we've got a real focus on customer and uh, customer journey, sorry, and content this year. Um, we've got some great speakers lined up from Bigfords, Robin Men's, Sea Link, uh, Refuel Creative. Actually, um, I think the head guy is going to be talking there. Uh, Kat, the tickets are I think it's uh, 120 for one day and then I two days. Everybody's, is everybody's been pretty good today, Ravina, though, you'd probably consider them our friend, wouldn't you? Oh, I would actually. I would actually. Look, if you would like a discount, please use the promo code REFUELFRIEND, uh, which will get you, I think, a 25% discount, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we'd love you all to come along. Uh, and we're so looking forward to returning to a face-to-face -face event. It is the biggest digital marketing event in Adelaide. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to have the support of the University um, of South Australia so that we can keep the cost down so it is a more accessible event for everybody um, and even made more so because everybody on this on this uh, attendee is definitely a friend. So uh, feel free to pop in the promo code Rachel Friend and you'll get a promo code, a, a discount on your... Oh, Jessica is definitely going to want to attend because we've got some good sessions on content creation there, don't we? We do, we do, we do, we do actually. Uh, we're actually going to be hearing uh, from, um, we've actually scored a B2B speaker as well this year. So that'll be uh, something uh, uh, good to, uh, for you in particular, Jessica, might be particularly useful for you. Um, but also uh, we do have um, speakers from the uh, tourism sector as well. And uh, yeah, Digital Adelaide is looking to be jam-packed uh, full of, all things, you know, marketing, particularly on the um, e-commerce and uh, email marketing, SEO as well. So basically, if you can think of uh, any aspect of digital, I think we got it covered this year over the two-day event. Um, you can attend one day or two. I'd recommend two because it's probably the best bang for buck you're going to get uh, in terms of um, professional development for marketing in South Australia. All right, well, we might wind it up there. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. This has been the, the best attended session of the new events this year, so that's really great. I'm sure it's got nothing to do with the quality of the speaker this month, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, next month is going to be very nonprofit focused, so um, make sure you jump on the Facebook page and register for that if you're a nonprofit. Um, Kat and I are going to be talking through um all the the very fun stuff that we need to talk to talk about tax time so we're going to be talking about planning for your new financial year looking at your budgets how much needs to be budgeted where you can potentially trim a bit by making use of donations and discounts programs um, we need all of the non-profit friends that we can on that call because we want that to be as interactive as possible um, have you got anything to add before we wrap up, Kat? I don't. It sounds like you guys really covered it. Thank you, Rubina, for an amazing and useful and informative presentation. This was 
I've got pages and pages of notes sitting here. <laughs> um, and really looking forward to jumping into tax time next month. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next month.